that it, you have a, a wearing couple hats. You're a cardiologist. You're working on urgent and emergent care issues you mentioned earlier. Um, but your organization is a payer organization. And how do you view some of these changes and the role of STLT2s both for patients with and without diabetes? Yeah, very simple. I mean, I don't know if the answer is that simple, but, but it's exactly what... Um, what uh, we've been talking about. And actually, when Steve made that comment, he knew I was going to jump in. He's always two moves ahead of us. So the, <laughs> the, the, the reality is, um, look at the perspective, right? just to reinforce the point. We spend $13 billion in, in heart failure patients. I'm not saying everything is heart failure related, but overall, that's a, that's a huge amount. We spend, um, it, so far, let's say $100 million in SGLT2, right? So look at the proportion, right? So, so it really is what's, what's the real value that this medication will bring to lower the total cost <clears throat> among heart failure patients. And, and that's, that's the perspective that, that, we, that, uh, that we need to take into account. That's far more economics that, uh, that are bringing, bring, uh, brought up by SGLT2 right now. So what we have done is uh, two things. One, as soon as the FDA got the approval, um, I actually happened to be part of the pharmacy and, and therapeutics committee as well. We went ahead and approved these medications for what they are for, including um, the ones related to non the cardiovascular benefits on non-diabetic patients. So we already, along with with what we have seen in the literature, because it's strong. Right? I think nobody will argue those results are very very strong. And then the other so you, approach that we just clarify. So you feel like that's the new standard of care and your payment policies reflect that? Our payment policies uh, approve that for that particular concept. Uh, interestingly enough, this weekend, over the weekend, I was reviewing our next uh, meeting in July where we're going to actually set uh, exactly the protocol of how is the LT2 will be used uh, for heart failure uh, patients, regardless of, of the diabetes status. So that's a step forward when it comes to a payer, right? We're not saying, well, it's for diabetes, but we're, we're, not, we're not waiting. We're actually saying it's, it's, it should be um, a group of it. And then this is, here's the other point, which is um, we alluded to. Are they just add-on when you fail other recognized well-established therapy? And we may need to start with that step, but you know, who's to say that six months, 12 months, so 18 months from now, we're going to say, listen, they can be first-line therapy because they're that good. Um, we're certainly something that is, is worth considering. And we're not uh, now going to be foreign to that concept because at the end of the day, you have to look at the, the broad, broad um, perspective of how to treat those, those people. And, and there's no question, SGLT2 are coming to make a difference. So let me ask Dr. Desai, I'll, I'll come right back to you, Steve. Let me ask Dr. Desai, where do you put the SGLT2 inhibitors in your treatment, you know, protocol, paradigm, however you want to say it, and what are the patients you look to, to put on those therapies? How does diabetes affect that decision? And then I'll open that up. Uh, uh, Stephen had a comment as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Neil. I think it's 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 a great you know it's a great area for us to explore. I'm curious what others are are, are doing and thinking. Um, so for us, I think you know we use them in the way that um, the evidence would suggest and and the guidelines have then you know recommended. So if you have a patient that has diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, I think you know th these would be part of the cornerstone of therapy, just like we think about you know statins and and antiplatelet drugs. Um, you've got to sort of think about, you know, an SGLT2 inhibitor for that patient that has diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Similarly, on the heart failure side, what we've seen so far with DAPA, and hopefully again will be extended in Emperor um, and, and other clinical trials programs, is that the SGLT2s inhibitors have a very important role to play in heart failure. Now, I think one of the real frustrations that we have all felt um, myself included, I know many colleagues, you know, around the country, is that there is this disconnect between the world of the evidence and the guidelines, and then what happens in terms of access and adoption, that despite our interest in trying to get patients on these therapies, they do face a substantial cost-sharing component, and that is a burden that we can't 
avoid talking about when we think about, you know, the patients that we're here to serve. And so I do hope that, you know, we get to a place where we move away from using drugs that may be, that may have a lower cost in terms of the cost of a medication. But when you look at total cost and you look at kind of the value of the therapy, I think what we've seen from SGLT2 inhibitors, reducing, you know, reducing death, reducing rates of atherosclerotic events, reducing hospitalizations for heart failure, um, those are incredibly costly and important burdens for patients and caregivers. And so when you put that all that together, I think these drugs deserve to be you know, front and center. And I think the guidelines will continue to evolve in that way should the evidence continue to pile up in the way that we um, expect and hope that it will. And I, I want to come back to guidelines, but I want to open it up now because uh, uh, Stephen had some comments and I believe he has a perspective on this that, that's unique as well. Well, I just wanted to add uh, that there is a special case and uh, it's something that everybody here recognizes that we see a lot. And that's the patient with reduced renal function. Uh, you know, take somebody who's, who's got a creatinine clearance of around 50. You know, there's a lot of evidence that there, because of this interplay between heart and kidney, and there's now accumulating evidence that SGLT2 inhibitors reduce albuminuria, but they also reduce the progression of renal insufficiency, certainly in the diabetic patient. And uh, I think the burdens of end-stage renal disease in diabetes, and of course, those end-stage renal disease patients are are also our heart failure patients because they can't get rid of salt and water. Right. You know, they're very difficult to treat. And there's rather impressive evidence of renal benefits of SGL2-2 inhibitors. So when you think about value, the value proposition, yes, they lower blood sugar. Yes, they prevent heart failure, but they also seem to prevent progression of renal disease. And uh, Nihar, I'm not sure how much of that data you've reviewed, but what I've reviewed suggests that it's a pretty impressive effect and one that should be considered in deciding who to treat. Uh, you know, if you've got a creatinine clearance of 90 or 100, that's one thing. If you're at 50, it's pretty easy to get from 50 to 30 to zero, and we want to prevent that. Yeah, Steve, I, th I think you're exactly right. I think, you know, we've, again, that's been a signal that has emerged with all the SGLT2 inhibitors. And, and what, you know, to your point, we've seen, you know, reductions in albuminuria, prevention of, you know, progression of kidney disease, and potentially avoidance of dialysis. And I think when you think about, you know, the cost burden, the quality of life, you know, implications for that, um, you know, again, it's, it, it's the enthusiasm around SGLT2 inhibitors for our sort of cardio, renal, cardio, metabolic, you know, patients, um, I think the reason for that is because the evidence has emerged that they are incredibly compelling. 